regarding the from your review of the hospital records. Oh, okay. Regarding the uh, victim's condition at the scene. Okay. Uh, well, at the scene, uh, he was uh, noted to have what's called a Glasgow Coma Scale, or GCS of 3. Uh, let, me, let me stop you there for a moment before you go further. Right. Uh, could you explain to the jurors what GCS means, what that is? Okay. Uh, that means Glasgow Coma Scale. It's really how conscious a person is. And the scale goes anywhere from 3, which would be something like this piece of wood here with absolutely no responses, to 15, which is anyone in this room. And how is it that the tests are done to try and prefer, uh, determine the number that's reached for the GCS scale? Sure. Uh, uh, they look for spontaneous eye movement, uh, verbal commands, uh, when you listen or, and react to what the uh, emergency person is saying, and motor. Uh, if I ask you to raise your hand, do you raise your hand? So all those, if you're able to do those, those are given a score of 5. So 5 plus 5 plus 5 is 15. If you can't do any of those, uh, then you have a you get a score of one. So you get one plus one plus one. Was there a GCS scale number for Mr. Taylor when he arrived at the hospital? Yes. And what was that? It was three. And what does three mean? Three means essentially uh, they're they're dead uh, on arrival. Uh, Do we have any sort of uh, pulse at that point in time? Uh, there's uh, one mention of maybe a slight pulse, but uh, when he arrived at the hospital, he had no pulses. I'm going to show you with the evidence as states exhibit 17. Okay. Do you recognize that? I believe it's a scene photo. Did you have a chance to review some of the scene photographs in the case? Yes. I want to direct your attention. If you could step down for a moment. I want to direct your attention to the center area of the photograph. What appears to be there in the center? Well, there seems to be uh, quite a bit of blood and uh, blood clot uh, in that uh, hallway. Is that amount of blood consistent with the injuries that you observed on Mr. Taylor? Uh, yes. Let's talk a little bit about those injuries. You could go ahead and have some, uh, Dr. Shindu, thank you. Um, when Mr. Taylor first arrived at the medical examiner's office for the autopsy, what are the first initial steps that you take? Well, the initial steps are to take some photos, uh, document uh, medical intervention, and uh, clean up uh, the skin and stuff to look for injuries and such. Uh, do you also weigh and measure uh, the person who comes into the autopsy? Yes, uh, we weigh, measure, take fingerprints uh, as well. What, were, what was Mr. Taylor's uh, weight and height at the time of the autopsy? Uh, we listed it as six foot three inches and three hundred thirty nine pounds. How old was he? Uh, reported to be the age of twenty four years. Injury, he had uh, the main 
injury was in his right groin area. Did you have an opportunity to prepare a diagram in connection with this offer? Yes. Show the council state 16 for an indication. I think it's still 16. Do you recognize it? Yes. How do you recognize it? Uh, it's my handwriting. Is that the diagram you prepared in connection with this case? Yes. Still move 16 in that one? If I could ask you to step down briefly. Explain to the jury what they're looking at. So these are general body diagrams that we use to document uh, injuries, tattoos, etc. And so here is the front of the body, and uh, I was diagramming the entrance wound, uh, which was here in the right groin area. The line here is the incision that the doctors made to get to the uh, injured blood vessel so they could repair it. Can we stop and wait for a moment? Show the council state 16 for an indication. Take a look at state 16 for identification. Do you recognize that? Yes. How do you recognize it? It has the case number as well as the incision I was talking about. Is it fairly that accurate to be kept with the incision with that? Yes. Still move 6D in evidence? Based upon my prior ruling, the classification of the rule would be admitted. It's a little enough classification 6D and I'm going to put it for 105. that this Y-shaped incision uh, was the location of the entry wound. Yes. First, can you explain to the jury why that Y-shaped incision is even there, what it was a result of? Sure. Uh, so the surgeons had to, there's blood coming out of this area once they're able to get his heart back up, and uh, uh, there's a lot of blood coming out of here, so they had to make an incision to get to the injured blood vessel so they could repair it. Are you able to tell uh, where along the location of the incision the entry wound is? Yeah, it's kind of hard to tell because the incision was made through the entrance wound, uh, but it most likely is right here because there's some abrasion right here. You can see the rest of the edges are kind of smooth, and as you get here, there's a little fragmentation. So that's uh, most likely where the injury is. Uh, and also underneath there is where the femoral artery is, which got injured. I'm showing you again, six. Exhibit 104 in evidence. Once the projectile entered in the location of that Y shaped incision, where did it travel next? Uh, so the bullet uh, went from the right groin and went to the, I guess, the inner thigh uh, and exited. And then it re entered the left leg in the inner thigh, and then the bullet was found in the left uh, leg. As the projectile passed through the first leg and the groin area that it went through, did it cause any damage to Mr. Taylor? Yes, uh, it damaged the femoral artery, which is the major artery that supplies blood to your leg. What would that result in, that sort of damage? Uh, pretty massive blood loss. Is that blood loss consistent with what you observed in the prior state's exhibit of the hallway photo? Yes. Now, you mentioned that it exited and then re-entered the body. Is that correct? No, uh, that's correct. Six C. Take a look at state 
Rule 6C clarification. Do you recognize that? Yes. How do you recognize it? It has the case number. And that's the case number we've been referring to today? Oh, that's correct. Is it fair and accurate to depict the exit and the entry rooms that we've just been describing to the jury? Yes. State Rule 6C is that right? So this is the right leg, this is the left leg, this is the thigh, inner thigh area. So the uh, entrance wound would be up here in the right groin and it exited here. Uh, the depth is a little odd, but uh, this gunshot wound is the re-entry wound into the left thigh. Uh, did the projectile remain in the left thigh? Uh, yes, it did. Can you explain to the jury what the difference is between a penetrating and a perforating gunshot wound? Sure. Uh, a perforating gunshot wound is a wound as a, a projectile that goes through something. So if you if you can recover a bullet, it's not perforating. It's what we call penetrating. So a penetrating gunshot wound is a bullet that goes into the skin but does not exit the skin. Are you able to determine from the autopsy the path of the projectile as it traveled through Mr. Taylor's? Uh, Legs. Yes. What was that path? It was uh, front to back, so it went from the front of the thigh to the back of the left leg. It also went downwards, uh, so in this direction, and then it went from uh, right to left. So, uh, um, we always take x-rays because bullets show up real nicely on x-rays and you can see that the bullet's right here. Uh, this is the left thigh. Is that where the bullet came to rest when it traveled through both thighs? Yes. Were you able to recover that projectile? Yes. up of the re-entry wound in the left thigh.
that we put the bullet in. It has my signature, the date, time, and my initials. And would that be a projectile that you recovered from the left thigh and Mr. Jason's body during the autopsy? Yes. Were you able to make a determination as to both cause of death and manner of death? Yes. Before getting there, you mentioned that there was extensive blood loss that occurred in this case as a result of the female artery being severed. Is that right? Yes. Once that occurs, um, what begins to happen to the body during that blood loss? Well, when you have a massive blood loss, uh, your brain uh, is one of the key uh, organs that needs oxygenation. And so after a few minutes of uh, a lot of blood loss, your brain no longer gets oxygen. And so that's when your body starts shutting down. What was done specifically to Mr. Taylor's femoral artery in an effort to try and save his life? Well, uh, once they were able to get a, the heart back and start pumping, they, were, uh, they went in to uh, take out the injured artery, at least that segment of injured artery, and replace it with a graft. Were they able to do that in this case? Yes, they're successfully able to do it. Now, once the graft is placed and the femoral artery is no longer severed and it's functioning, why is it that the person isn't able to survive? 
Well, at this point, uh, he's gone so far uh, with a lack of oxygen to his brain for so long that even though they fixed it, uh, he's only alive in the sense that because of the drugs that are given to him to keep the heart rate up and, uh, and such like that. Otherwise, uh, you take off the drugs and everything like that, the brain has been injured so much uh, from the lack of oxygen that uh, the body would just shut down. Did it appear that there was already a lack of oxygenation to the brain at the time he was arrived at the hospital? Yes. And how were you able to determine that? Uh, by the GCS scale, GCS of three. Does that mean that he was non-responsive? Uh, yes. In this particular case, you mentioned you were able to reach a conclusion as to both cause of death and manner of death. Is that correct? Yes. What was your conclusion as to the cause of death in this case? It was a gunshot wound of the extremities, lower extremities. And what was the manner of death? Homicide. One moment. Many further. One question. The state rests its case in chief against the defendant. All right, how's the jury? Before we proceed on to the next phase of the trial, stay ready rested. We need to talk to the parties outside of your presence. Um, let me do this. Let me ask you if you can step back in the jury room for a few moments. Just step back into the jury room, please. Thank you. 
felony convictions, if I remember correctly, which you're welcome to look at. And I believe that Mr. Rivera Sr. has a felony conviction. Okay. I just want to see the certified. So I know that I didn't see anything on Mr. Rivera Sr. I saw a little on Mr. Mays. There was a second. Oh, I'm sorry, Jeremy Jackson. So Mays is two? Yeah. Okay. Can you see it? On Mays? Yeah. No, but I would on Mr. Rivera Sr.
continue on with it. Uh, we'll go through a few hours this afternoon, and then we'll look at another matter that we need to address at the end of the day without your presence. So I'll be keeping you late today. Uh, have a great lunch, follow all my previous instructions, and we'll see you at one o'clock. All right. Ladies and gentlemen, the passion tablets forward. Please make sure you have all your personal belongings with you. And we'll see you at 1 o'clock at the other end of the fourth floor hallway.
or whatever else it is that I might have wished to do in order to address it if I decide to address it at all. This is the first I've heard. Monday 12. I thought the state just said it was a non-issue, Judge. I'm not saying the news. They just said that it's not a contested issue as to whether the camera that they're acting like they're, they're prejudiced to the point that a witness should be excluded. The hardest remedy in court. Did we have a subpoena out to detect the action? I guess it's my question. I guess what the state's telling me is, is right now not under subpoena because they were the one ones that were playing that call. Right, we're going to ask the court hold them under the state subpoena for tomorrow, which will give them time to talk to them today or tonight. And we can tell you we know whether or not the state is even subpoenaing them. It may well be that subpoenas would have gone out for everyone who was on that list. But for now, as to whether he was served or not, I do not know. Is this the only thing that's going to be asked for him? It's his only other role, uh, Judge, is that he contacted Mr. Rivera Sr. after the formal arrest was made to say, you know, your son's down at the employee. Um, if that became a real issue for the state as far as preparation, we can leave that off. I mean, the main reason we're calling him is to demonstrate that there was a camera set up before any discussions began. Which the state just said they were aware. Right. So, which, is, which the state just said that you were aware of that. There was a camera set up before the discussion began. I do not recall saying that exactly. Oh. What I recall saying is that the fact that they could have reported the interview um, and chose not to do so is an uncontested matter in this case. And I believe both of those witnesses testified to that proposition. Well, Judge. Yes, the deposition was taken. We An update from the defense and as much as to what his availability is. And then we'll go from there. He's out of time on vacation and they noticed that and put it in the system. Too bad, so sad. We're done. I don't know. Hey, I don't know how I'm going to find that out, Judge. I mean, I'm, I'm sure the state will inquire with him over the over lunch break. Or okay, I thought he said I'm taking the defense. I was going to say, oh, I'm sorry. I'm not going to have much lunch. If I told my every day, I have a feeling I'll be put on hold until the end of the trial, Judge, on this one. <laughs> All right, thanks. Okay. Um, so I think, is there anything else we can do? Well, I heard the same Judge was at pictures we planned on introducing. Oh, they had an objection on one of them. Oh, which one was that? Are these the ones that you were going to use initially in, uh... There's some additional as well. Okay. Hopefully we'll use it again. The one they're objecting to is the one of the Fort Myers Police Department headquarters. It's just a photograph of the outside of the building. I'm looking at these, you know, around the city now. I'm also going to go and see the parking lot to the uh, Florida Department of Law Enforcement. It's probably just to show the expanse of the building at some point. It is. Yeah, it's right. our page for you. Correct. Right. Oh, I think it's yeah, the I think it's designed to show the mortgage in the front. Well, Judge, I mean, I, well, the state says their objection is relevant. The, the state made this irrelevant. It would be done in the front. Oh, is that DLE? That? No, 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 the, um... Oh, the other one that says Honor, Ethics, Accountability, Respect, Teamwork. You know, part of their presentation seems to be that they might pass the Lee County Sheriff's... Is oh, that the Lee County Sheriff's Office? Is that the one I... Well, part of, their, part of their presentation is that they might pass with the law enforcement. I don't see a picture of the other agency, and I see that one. Being fair, Judge, the jail doesn't really have any distinguishing features on the outside of it. It's merely an awning and a small sign, but everybody knows it's the jail connected to the courthouse. It doesn't a picture of a little just like a picture of a wall. Mm -hmm. So which ones are they objecting to? This one is the Fort Myers Police, Police Department, which is Exhibit A4. Yes, sir. Wow. Judge, is there anyone who wants to see that under your 
Eight zero seven. That's just a couple. No, I don't know. So you guys are going to try and authenticate that? Oh yeah. So yeah, there's other basis for this. So we have 